Today, I'll teach you the process behind creating these animations and images with D5 Render, focusing on replicating renders from sources like Pinterest, because the key to rapid learning and the advancement of your visualization skills is through studying and copying the work of professionals. So let's get started. First step is to break down the image into smaller, more manageable steps. So for this image, I've broken it down into models, materials, environment, and assets. And I'm gonna work in D5 Render because it has truly become my favorite 3D rendering software. But feel free to use any software you feel confident in. We're trying to learn rendering skills and it's much easier to do that in a software or a medium that you already know how to use. Remember that we're not aiming for an exact replica. The goal here is to study and learn. With that, the first task is models. If we look at the image, there are three types of buildings. This green building with the vertical elements, a greenhouse and a terrace housing with pitched roofs and pergolas. To collect the models for this image, I took the front part of a building that I designed in my masters. I modeled these wooden fins in SketchUp and then added them to the main building. With the D5 Live Sync, I can easily connect my model into D5 Render. This is what it looks like as soon as I open the program. Not bad, right? If not, you can download it for free in the D5 page for SketchUp, for Revit, any other program. Now, if I modify anything in my model, it will update in D5. So if you've got two screens or a really wide screen, this will really change the game for you. Sometimes I find that the live sync doesn't work as soon as I make the changes. So if that happens to you, just refresh the live sync. I had some issues later on while I was rendering the materials and I figured out that it was because some of the faces were stretched or reversed. So I used this plugin by Fredo Tools, which is called Auto Reverse Faces. Free, easy to use and saves you so much time. As for the faces that were stretched, it was kind of my fault because I was scaling things instead of properly modeling them. So reapplying the materials helped with that and also if you click on a face and check the proportions of the material, if it's a square proportion or if there's no odd numbers, then you're good to go. But it's best to just avoid this step by using the push and pull tool instead of the scale tool if you want it to make things bigger or smaller. Even though all of these look grey, they're actually different materials because in D5, I want to apply the same material but rotate it to replicate joints and connections found in real life. And I only did this to the parts of the building that were close to the camera. What stands out is the green timber facade. It's very glossy, I almost thought it was metal. The glass on this greenhouse is very reflective compared to the glass on these windows. While there's a lot of different types of wood, the overall tone of the materials is very muted. What's good about D5 is that they already have a good library of free materials in their assets. So I'm gonna search for wood and having decided which one to use, select the material, download it and click on the model to apply the material onto its surface. A good example of a ready-made material is this gravel, which already comes with a displacement map. Now, if you want to modify the material afterwards, you can always go to the inspector tab and adjust the base color, maps, or UV. You can stretch the material, offset, rotate, change its color. In some cases, I suggest you turn on this round corner because it helps with the realism of the image because nothing in real life has perfect straight edges. You can also go to the base color map and here you can change the properties of the color map. So the contrast, the UV or saturation, color, etc. And that's how I actually changed the color for this wooden material. As you can see, it's just a normal wooden texture, but I changed its color to green. And to get the shiny and reflective look from the inspiration image, increase the specular. Because specular determines the shininess or reflectivity of a material. Roughness determines how smooth or rough the material is, so that defines how light scatters across the surface of the material. Meaning that the smoother the material, the shinier it'll be. 
You can save this material to your local assets so you can use it for future projects and you can also batch import PBR materials. There's so many different types of glass that you can apply to your model. I just used normal glass and made sure that the color was completely white and the transparency is one. Check on thickness if you model your glass as a singular surface because in reality glass has a thickness that will really affect all of the parameters of your glass. I used this ribbed glass on the railing because I thought it looked really good. You can change it to be horizontal but I don't know why you would because it looks so much better vertical. I also noticed that the glass in the render had almost no refraction which is kind of strange. I mean it does look cleaner. One of the things that I always used to do in post-production was grass because it never looked 3D or realistic. But D5 has three different styles of grass that you can choose from, all 3D and look super realistic. You can adjust its height, density, trim, blend amount, so many other features. I actually did the grass for this image a different way, so I'll show that to you later. Once you're done applying materials, you should have something like this. That was so easy with impressive results. One of the key visual elements of a good render is the vegetation, and this image is no exception. I just love how this image is filled with grass, plants, shrubs, creating a wild and organic meadow rather than a formal garden. At the back, there are a few plant pots and vines hanging from the pergola. I don't like the look of potted plants in renders, so I might omit that. Vegetation might be common sense to some people, but I honestly struggled so hard with this part because it just looked unnatural. I fixed it by going to D5 Render Express Scenes. So these are amazing projects all done through D5, which you can download for free, dissect, and study. And when I say study, I mean study. So I took note of the names of the plants they chose, their size, placement. Honestly, if you read my notes, they probably sound really dumb to landscape architects, but hey, it got the job done. Now the lesson here is less is more and to choose native plants to your site. Instead of placing each tree individually, there are two methods. We can use the brush tool or the path tool. So for this, let's use the path tool. It's right here at the top. Select the assets that you want. You can use up to six, I think, and then draw the path. You can adjust things like the number of assets, direction, spacing, offset, size, etc. This makes it so easy to create natural looking vegetation. And in some areas where you want to be more precise, you can just drag and drop each tree individually. If you click on V on your keyboard, that will switch between the move tool and the scale tool so you can easily resize your assets. Always go back to your view, that way you can place things that directly affect your scene. And if you click on this, you can scale the asset disproportionately. When in doubt and you want a taller tree, just lift the tree, like no one's gonna know. How would they know? I added two trees to the foreground of the image to frame it better. This is how I've done my grass, so apparently when I looked at the models from the Scene Express, they don't use the grass material, they actually make their own grass by selecting different grass assets, increasing the radius of the brush all the way to the max, and this will scatter it across the surface. And you can see how it looks so natural. It has a few patches of short and long. I think it looks so realistic this way. I'm going to use the path tool again for this hedge. And you don't have to go to the top. You can also use the path tool from here. As for the brush tool, you can select up to six models. You can change the radius of the brush, density and size, and it'll work just like a Photoshop brush, but for 3D objects. Then you can use the eraser tool to erase certain parts of it or increase the radius and erase the whole thing. When you use the brush tool, it doesn't come up in your layers. It actually shows here in the brush history. And that's how I was able to achieve the different layers of shrubs and vegetation. Now, when you're selecting your assets, make sure to use the search bar or the filters to find the exact asset that you want. 
You can also filter dynamic or high definition assets. Remember that you can also scale, replace and fine tune these assets. So is this bench too small? Click on V to switch from move to scale and then scale it up or down. Need a fuller tree? Click on replace from assets and choose a different tree. Do you need a different finish to this? Pick a different material and apply it to the surface. Just like that. It makes the process so efficient. One of the cool assets in D5 is this background drop for autumn trees that fill out any empty areas of your model. They also have 3D buildings that you can download if you wanted an urban image. And these types of assets are so helpful for adding shadows, reflections, and also it places your building in its urban environment. And what's good about their assets is that the materials are well applied, they have good texturing, it doesn't add too much bulk to your file like other rendering softwares, and it just gives a more realistic feel to our images. If you want to impress people with your 3D renderings, you must use these interior parallax. They make it look like you've spent so much time rendering and 3D modeling, when in fact, it's so easy. Select one and place it behind the glass of your model and it will look like an interior space. Now when you're done with adding people and assets, this is what the image looks like. I recommend organizing your assets into layers or groups, that way you can keep your file organized and you can turn them on and off when you need to. For the environment, the sky is blue with a few clouds, the sun is high on the left side, as you can tell from the shadows and the strong contrast between light and shadow, especially here. The space feels amazing though, likely set on a warm summer day. However, I would like to add more trees to frame the image better, but we'll just trust the process. To achieve this environment, you have two options, Geo and Sky or HDRI. Geo and Sky allows you to pick a specific point of time, change parameters of the sun and clouds. You can add fog and precipitation in both options, but I think that fog, especially in the back where these three buildings meet, can help with the sense of depth of the image. And I'm not talking about crazy foggy images, I'm talking about just a little. How I like to do it is I would increase the parameters all the way to the max just to see how it looks and start adjusting the distance of it so that it aligns just behind the main building which helps bring it into focus. Once I'm happy with its distance, I can then lower the other parameters. If you think it's not affecting your image, turn the fog on and off and you'll be surprised. You can also add some rain. For this, you will have to switch the display to dynamic to see the full effects. But I find that with really great images, they always have a little bit of puddle on the gravel. So I'm gonna set the rain strength to zero and keep the puddle. As for HDRI, so HDRI stands for high dynamic range images. So they actually capture light way more realistically than Geo and Sky, but personally I haven't had much success with importing my own HDRI, although the ones that are already in D5 render are great and they've got so many different options. However, some are too bright or too dark right off the bat, so I do recommend adjusting the values of the skylight and the background to fit your scene. You can also rotate the HDRI and then have the sun in a custom direction. So you can set the altitude and the azimuth of the sun. And you can do this with all of the HDRIs. So we've pretty much talked about everything I've done to this image. So it's time to set the scene and click on render. You've got two options to move around the model. One is orbit and the other is fly. I used to use Orbit, but personally, I've been finding Fly so easy, it's almost like gaming. You can change the navigation mode here as well as the eye level. So 1.8 meters is usually good height for renders. Always make sure that your view is in two-point perspective for the render. And here you can also change the field of view. 
I recommend that the auto exposure is turned off and you can adjust the exposure through effects later. You can also go to display to use the rule of thirds and help you position your scene. Click on this to save the scene. As you can see, it took a few tries to get the scene right, but I also use scenes to navigate through my model. So I have one scene with everything turned off if I want to move around freely or test out different lighting or effects or environment changes. Now click on render and here you can render your images or panoramas. You can change again the POV, the focal length, aspect ratio, preset size, custom, or even export channels. But honestly, you could do everything in D5 Render without any post-production. So I didn't end up exporting any channels. Once you're happy, add that to your rendering queue. You can also export vertical or horizontal videos for social media. So this is the one I'll be uploading on my Instagram. Make sure to follow me if you haven't already. And to set an animation, click on here to add a clip. Add the first view, which is your scene. I'm going to pan slightly to the right and then add another scene. You can change the resolution, the format, the frame rate of a video and then add to your rendering queue. You can change the length of the animation here. So I think five seconds should be enough time. Adjust the settings and add it to your rendering queue. I've added all three of the exports to my rendering queue and now I can render all of them all together while I work on other things. So this is how the image turned out. I'm actually so, so happy with it. It's definitely not an exact replica of the original, but it's really close and I'm proud of myself because it has come a long way. I can show you all of the initial renders that I've done for this project and how it evolved. This isn't even half the renders because I got too much, I deleted the beginnings, but you can see how it evolved and it just shows that perfection doesn't exist, but progression. So the more that you practice or work on something, the better you will be. And saying this, I want to make a tiny more change, which is the background because I didn't really like the autumn trees because it's set in the summer and this is autumn. Please tell me I am not the only perfectionist here. So I decided to add a tennis court, which ended up being so massive, like wow. And then added some buildings and trees to give a bit of context, you know? I moved the building all the way to the back so that there is a gap between the building and the pergola where you see a little bit of the sky and some breathing space. You can apply a lot, change the exposure, contrast, highlight, all of that in the effect tab of your image. And with that, I'm finally happy with this image and I can take it to post-production. All I really want to do is use the burn tool on the edges just to make them darker or less saturated. That's just the style and look that I like. I mean, you could do this in D5 as well. They have a vignette option, but I want to be more precise with it. You can see the difference when I turn on and off these layers. It's really subtle, but I think it improves the image massively. And these are the final images. If we compare it to the inspiration image, I feel like they're really close, except mine maybe is a little more saturated, but I'm still so happy with it and I learned so much from this exercise. I hope that you found this video helpful. Let me know in the comments down below if there are any images or illustrations from Pinterest you'd like me to attempt to recreate. And also let me know if I succeeded in creating this render or was it a flop? Don't forget to subscribe and follow me on Instagram if you haven't already. I'm Rishishuru and I'll see you next time.